Hello there everyone. Today I have a very exciting video in which we're going to be discussing Justine by the Marquis du Sade. And the Marquis du Sade is famous for having these very, very graphically sexual novels in which it basically amounts to an attack against virtue, against religion, against social norms, against morality as being objective. And in this sense, it stands as a very stark instance of advocacy for moral nihilism, which is the idea that morality doesn't exist in the absolute sense, that there may be morality that we make up in order to get along with each other, or indeed for sad to abuse and control one another, but it is not therefore objective and binding to all of society. And as such, Sad's work here in Justine is basically accounting as a form of retribution against virtue on pragmatic grounds, at looking at the way that virtue is not rewarded in society, and the way that greed and deceit are rewarded. Now, Justine basically tells the story of a girl named Justine. And at 12, her and her sister, Juliet, who's three years older than her, so 15, they both become orphans. And Justine and Juliet are both absolutely gorgeous. That is, their crowning quality that they share together is that they are absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous. Now, the only difference is Justine is the epitome of virtue and innocence and timidity, whereas Juliet is the epitome of cunning, um, getting what she wants using her looks. So she is kind of lambasted at the time in which the Marquis du Sade is writing as a sort of moral degradation of society. But Throughout this story, we are going to see the ways in which Justine is constantly torn down, and virtue is constantly sat to the wayside in exchange for greed, temptation, violation, in which Juliet is able to benefit from all this and gain a salary of several hundreds of thousands of um, I can't remember the name of the, it's all French currency, so it's very, very weird for me. But we're going to kind of go through about 30 pages, just this little summary of this interaction that's going on, in which Juliet has basically gone through her life doing whatever she wants, including marrying three different men and killing each of them in secret such that she can steal their money. And... Constantly throughout this work, Sad is presenting us with a steel man version of virtue, which is to say, this is the um, this is the prevailing sentiment of the time, and indeed still today, in a sense, with regards to the values of virtue, the way the virtuous life will reward one than boast. And constantly, he is going to turn that into a punching bag and have that quality in the form of Justine be abused, raped, hurt, lambasted, feigned in exchange for all the sorts of debauchery which make the Marquis du Sade so famous. And Juliet basically ends up with this very rich man, and they see a girl come out of a carriage, and she is just the most innocent looking girl ever. And yet she is shackled and 
she's tied up like a criminal, so weak that she would assuredly have fallen over if her guards had not supported her. And apparently, she has been accused when Juliet and this man go up to the guards of hers. They, they ask, what has she been accused of? And apparently, she's been accused of murder, theft, and arson. But the soldiers admit they're, they're not sure how she could have done it. She's just the most innocent-looking thing ever. And this girl hasn't gotten a name yet insofar as the parts I've read. I just... I got so excited, I just had to make a lecture on it. Um, but I'm presuming that this may or may not be Justine. In, um, you know, this is kind of, we see the end of the path that she took, and then she's going to recount all the stuff that's happening. But basically, Juliet and her man decide that they want to hear this girl's story. They want to hear what happened. And I quote from page 15, To tell you the story of my life, Madame said the beautiful wretch, is to offer you the most striking example of the misfortunes of innocence. It is to accuse the hand of heaven. It is to question the will of the supreme being. It is a kind of revolt against the sacred, his sacred wishes. I dare not. And that is in fact the framing premise of this whole work, is that Sad is very famous for being an atheist. And he utilizes virtue and he clothes it in all the most beautiful garbs possible in order to turn it into a punching bag and in order to use it as a way to basically attack morality in so doing and attack people who appeal to God for their morality, for example. Now, the girl takes us back in time, and she has basically been imprisoned, and this lady named Dubois has set the conciergerie on fire, and they have now escaped. And the girl decides to give herself the name Therese. We know that's not her actual name, but she uses it as a sort of pseudonym. And Dubois basically tells her, Look, I've got some advice for you. Abandon the path of virtue, which, as you can see, has never brought you success. So constantly, Justine is being met with the idea that she should give up virtue. That she should abandon her principles, that they are not realistic, that they will only lead to suffering, and that the insistence on virtue is in fact a way to keep the weak weak. Now, in response, Therese says, I am aware of all the risks I have run in following those honest instincts which will always remain in my heart. But however thorny the path of virtue may be, I shall always prefer them to the dangerous attractions of crime. There are religious principles in me which, thank heaven, will never leave me. If providence makes my life's journey difficult, it is to reward me for it in a better world. I am consoled by such hopes, which may give succor to sorrows, relieve my suffering, fortify me in my distress, and give me the strength to endure all the ills that it will please God to send me. This joy would immediately be extinguished in my soul if I were to soil it with crimes, and to addish, and in addition to the fear of retribution in this world. I would face the painful prospect of punishment in the next, which would not leave me with a single moment of the peace I desire. And we see right here the framing ideas behind virtue, which Sad is criticizing, namely that virtue and punishment are created in order to uphold an ideal notion of peace and desire which appeals to everyone. Yet Sad is going to, and always in the mouth of characters who oppose the virtuous, whether that's Justine or Therese, is going to put in these characters' mouths the opposition to virtue. I quote from page 27, the next paragraph. Such absurd ideas will soon lead to the workhouse, my girl, 
said Dubois, raising her eyebrows. Believe me, you should abandon God's justice, his punishments or rewards to come. All that these platitudes are good for is to make us die of hunger. Oh, Therese, the hard hearts of the rich justify the bad conduct of the poor. If their purses opened to serve our needs, if humanity reigned in their hearts, then virtues would flourish in ours. But as long as our misfortune and our patient endurance of it, our good faith and our servitude serve only to tighten our chains, our crimes will become their work and we would be most foolish to refuse to commit them when they can lighten the yoke which our cruel fate imposes on us. We were all born equal in nature, Therese, and if it pleases fate to undermine this first article of the general law, it is up to us to correct such whims and to use our talents to counter the usurpations of those stronger than us. So as such, Dubois is really highlighting that we should revolt against virtue, that virtue is a chain or an illusion used to keep the lower in their situation and to keep the higher above them. To make seeking retribution seem like a sin instead of the burden which one ought to uphold. Because one of the key things that Sad is trying to keep in mind is essentially framing his work as an appeal to nature. He is looking at nature and he is saying, look, we like to say that virtue is rewarded and that vice is punished, but that's not how things work. We see all the time chaos reigning in the normal processes in which the world works, whether this be tectonic plates moving, whether this be political strife. And as such, he says, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, is that Saad is a materialist and an atheist. And as such, he says, if everything is material, then all transgression is equal to all other transgression. Whether this is a transgression of a waterfall against the rocks below, or whether this is the transgression of the sovereign against his citizens, or the poor against the rich. All of these forms of retribution are equally possible, and provided one has the ability, Sad is trying to say that we should in fact take advantage of the pragmatic usage of revolt. Sad states quite ironically, still in the mouth of Dubois, truly difficult to be temperate and sober when one is all the time surrounded by the most succulent dishes, so difficult for them to be sincere when they have no reason to lie. But as for us, Therese, whom barbarous providence, which you are mad enough to idolize, has condemned to the humiliation of crawling along like the snake in the grass, we who are looked upon with disdain because we are poor, who are treated like slaves because we are weak, we whose lips are moistened only with gall and whose feet tread upon nothing but thorns, you want us to abstain from crime when its hand alone can open the door to life, can maintain and preserve us in it and prevent us from losing it. You want us to remain perpetually submissive and degraded, while the class that dominates us enjoys all fortune's favors, and our lot is nothing but hardship, despondency, and pain, only want, tears, the branding of the criminal, and the scaffold. And I mean, man, just what a, what a scathing argument we have here that when people are in a situation to be dominated, they will be dominated, and that virtue and morality stands in the way of those in a cruel condition from being able to arise out of it. And the interesting thing about Sad is that the way he frames his writing can often be interpreted and enjoyed, or at least understood, 
from within a theistic lens. Oftentimes, two words that are synonymous in his writings are nature and providence. Now, of course, nature is the natural will of the cosmos, so to speak. It is that which is whether or not we like it to be. And so is the same for providence, except it is the will of God. And within this, Sad still thinks that even if we could appeal to divine providence, still we would have situations where if it is placed in front of us, we ought to entertain such an action. Continually in the mouth of Dubois, Sad writes, When you have a better understanding of it, my child, you will be convinced that if it places us in a situation where evil becomes necessary, and at the same time gives us the chance to commit it, it is because this evil serves the laws of providence as much as good does, and derives an equal benefit from both. It has created us all equal, but he do, who disrupts this equality is no more guilty than he who seeks to restore it. Both are acting on inborn impulses, and both should follow these impulses and enjoy them. And an important point that we see here is that Sad is a psychological hedonist, which is to say, if we have desires, we have them for a reason. Whether it's imparted by God or by nature, we have them, and it is not a sin to have them. Otherwise, why would we, why would we have them, according to Sad? And he says that as such, we should at least not be surprised when we see another engage in in certain actions, in selfishness, in greed, in harm. Now, as Thérèse continues to tell her story, we are encountered by a man named Ironheart. And what has happened is Thérèse has been forced into a criminal gang as a way to maintain some sort of um, monetary commission in order to continue to survive. And Ironheart is one of the men in this place, and they're sleeping in the forest, and Ironheart comes up and asks if he can sleep with her. Not even if he can have sex with her, but merely that he can literally sleep with her. And he states, you must serve our interests or our pleasures, and later demands that one determine your own destiny. And he has this conversation with Therese where he's asking her about virtue, asking her once again that, he should, that she should lambast her virtue, that she should get rid of her virtue, and that she should embrace a criminal lifestyle. And he eventually asks because this is one of the important points of Sad, if they can have sex, but more specifically, that they can have anal sex. And he says this so that Therese might feel at ease that she's not being deflowered, that she will still be considered virtuous, that her body will be unblemished for future suitors who look upon her flower and see that it is intact. And Therese doesn't like this. She's kind of on the fence. She's like, well, I've heard it hurts. And also, think about Sodom and Gomorrah. She's like, isn't this a moral depravity? As such, Iron Heart responds that He's going to set her thinking straight. He's going to convince her that she's wrong, that she can be at ease. And he states as follows. The loss of the seed intended to propagate the human species, dear girl, is the only crime that can exist. In that case, if this seed is placed in us with the sole purpose of propagation, then I grant you that it is an offense to turn it away from its object. But if it can be demonstrated that, in placing the seed in our loins, nature's aim is far from being propagation alone, what does it matter, Therese, whether it is lost in one place or another? 
The man who changes its object in that case does no more harm than nature when it makes no use of it. Now, do not these losses of nature which we have only to intimate take place in many cases? The very fact that it is possible for them to happen is a first proof that they do not offend against nature. So, right, he's saying right here that, look, if semen was only for the purposes of propagation, then, of course, wasting it would be a shame and it would be a crime. But he says it's not, because all the time it exists in the body of a man and it dies. Most of it goes completely unused in terms of propagation. And he continues on. These losses are affected a hundred million times a day by nature herself. Nocturnal emissions, the uselessness of seed when women are already pregnant. Are these losses not sanctioned by her laws? And do they not prove that, perfectly insensitive to whatever might be the consequences of that fluid to which we are crazy enough to attach so much value, she allows its loss with the same indifference with which she brings it about each day? Do they not prove that, while she tolerates reproduction, it is far from always being her intention, that she wants us to multiply, but that since she gains no more from one of her actions than from another that is contrary to it, the choice that we may make is indifferent to her, that giving us the power to create, not to create or to destroy, we either please nor offend her more in selecting from one or other of these options the one that will suit us best that the one we choose, being the result of her power and influence over us, will surely always please her far more than it will risk offending her? Oh, believe me, Therese, nature is far less concerned about those mysteries which we are foolish enough to worship. Since she allows us to burn our incense at any temple we choose, our sacrifice cannot offend her. The failure to reproduce, the losses of the seed that serves reproduction or its extinction, and even when it has germinated, the destruction of the embryo long after its formation, all of these things, Therese, are imaginary crimes which are of no interest to nature, and which it makes mock of, as it does of all our other institutions that frequently offend instead of serving her. So this is kind of a funny little instance where, of course, you know, he's talking about that uh, we can burn our incense in whatever temple we want, which is to say we can have sex with whatever parts of each other we want. And his grounds for this is that, once again, all violation is equal. All actions are merely intensities or degrees of shifting or disruption. And that as such, all of the crimes that we usually take as sacrosanct, built upon virtue, is in fact something which nature never decided that we ought not to do. That all the time, seed goes to waste. All the time, nocturnal emissions happen. All the time, embryos die. And all of this testifies to nature's indifference to our moral precepts. Now, after all this has happened, Ironheart gets worked up and he is abusing Therese, but they end up having to leave because they see some people coming on a carriage and the gang decides that they're going to go kill them. So they kill three men and they get 200 louis in return, which is, you know, this is currency. And people are complaining saying, quote, it wasn't really worth committing three murders for such a small sum. And Dubois responds to this to basically intimate that what is supreme is self-interest. She says, what makes you think that 200 louis are not worth three murders? The value of everything must be calculated only in relation to our interests. The extinction of each of our victims counts for nothing compared with us. It surely wouldn't matter a fig to us whether those individuals were alive or in the tomb. 
Consequently, if in such a case we can derive the slightest benefit from it, we should, without any remorse, promote that interest, because where a thing is completely indifferent to us, if we are wise and in charge of events, we should def definitely make sure they are profitable for us, regardless of any harm caused to our adversary. This is because there is no reasonable comparison between our concerns and those of others. The former affect us physically, while the latter are of only moral interest to us, and moral feelings are deceptive. Only physical sensations are true. So here, Sad is really pointing out that morality is something we've invented. This is the very core of moral nihilism. And in fact, many ethical systems, such as social contract theory, for example, attempt to ground morality in self-interest, the likes of which Sad is promoting here. That yes, we do act in our own self-interest, and that, as such, we should be aware of that. But Sad is saying concretely that there is nothing wrong with self-interest, and that we should, again, at the very least, not be surprised when people partake in that self-interest to get what they want. Because harm to ourselves affects us physically, to our very core of our being, yet the external suffering of others can at best only affect us physically or emotionally, and Sad's argument is that the latter is relatively inconsequential. And in a sense, if I ask you, would you rather watch someone experience five minutes of the worst suffering imaginable, or yourself experience that same five minutes of the worst suffering imaginable, I guarantee you, you would rather, if, I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong, I'd love to hear about it in the comments, I guarantee you, you would rather watch someone experience that suffering than you experience it yourself. And if you say you would rather take it, I, I ask you to think about what does the worst suffering really imply? And Sad's point is that if you would reply that you would like to take that on, on what grounds? On recompense in a later life, in the afterlife? Sad doesn't believe in that. And again, this is where the rubber meets the road. And we just have to, you know, th there, there are limits to this, of course, that we can talk about if, if there is an afterlife. But Sad's point is that that assumption of recompense for the sufferer does not exist. And furthermore, Dubois explains that remorse is really weakness. She states... The weakness of our organs, our feeble-mindedness, the accursed prejudices with which we were raised, the vain terrors of religion or of our laws, all of these things hold back the ignorant from pursuing a career of crime, preventing them from aiming for the biggest prizes. Yet any individual, filled with strength and vigor, endowed with an active and well-organized mind who puts himself above all, all others, and rightly so, will be able to weigh their interests against his, scoff at God and men, risk death, and despise laws, in the firm conviction that the only interests he need serve are his own. He will believe that the greatest amount of harm done to others, of which he will have no physical sensation, cannot begin to compare with the least little pleasure brought at the expense of the hugest of crimes. Pleasure fills and is inside him while he is untouched by the consequences of his crimes which are outside him. Now, I ask, what reasonable man would not prefer what he himself enjoys to what is foreign to him? How could such a man not consent to commit an act the unpleasant effects of which are external to him, in order to obtain something that to him is most agreeable. So, again, this is confirming, or rather solidifying, the notion that 
personal suffering to oneself affects one with the utmost intensity, whereas the suffering of others, well, it affects one very little. And in fact, Saad argues throughout this by depicting these various sexual exploitations, you know, I mean, rape, um, defecating in people's mouths, like everything you can imagine happens in here. It's quite crazy. He shows that, in fact, the strong like to watch the weak suffer. Now, Therese, rightly so, responds with a criticism that many may levy. She says, What finer defense of virtue than the proof of its necessity, even amongst criminals, than the certainty that their unity would not survive for a single moment without virtue? So, right, Therese is saying that virtue is necessary for unity. Without virtue of every man against every man, well, we would just have Hobbes's state of nature. We would have a state in which everyone acts out of their self-interest and no one is held back from anything. Now, Sad wants to actually reverse this a little bit and say that not only is moral action selfish, but the in actuality, violation is our solution, and that it would be in our better interest to risk going back to that state of nature than to be in permanent shackles under the guise of the social contract, which is where everyone agrees, voluntarily at least, this is how the theory goes, and this is, of course, theorized by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that people give up a certain amount of their rights such that they can coexist with one another. And this is based off the idea that people will act in their self-interests, and provided that everyone agrees, for example, that we won't murder each other, then we actually get along better. Now, Ironheart responds to the objection that virtue is what keeps us together. It is what binds society. And Ironheart states, It isn't virtue that keeps criminals together. It's egoism and self-interest, showing your praise of virtue to be erroneous and based on an illusory hypothesis. It isn't out of virtue that, considering myself, I suppose, to be the strongest in the gang, I don't stab my companions to death to get their share. It's because then I would be all alone and would thereby deprive myself of the means by which I could secure the fortune that I expect to obtain with their help. This is the only motive that equally stays their hand from striking me. Now, as you can see, Therese, this motive is purely selfish with not the slightest trace of virtue. In other words, the reason we stay together is out of selfishness. And in fact, this is what Thomas Hobbes affirms. And it's the reason that for Hobbes, God is so critical in founding and maintaining society. Because for Hobbes, God is an overarching coercive force. Those are his words, even though he believes in God, which I find so strange that he can just, he can just love this idea. But that God acts as the overarching coercive force which maintains people in the social contract and keeps people from violating it. That God stands ahead as if the most terrifying suffering which in fact keeps people in their unity precisely because of their self-centeredness. And one may react to Sad and say, well, this all sounds rather dangerous. This sounds just preposterous. How can we, how can we live in a society where we just accept that we're all selfish and that there's nothing wrong with acting in our self-interest, even to the detriment of others? And of course, Ironheart has a response to this. I quote him, But, you will say, will not this bring about a state of perpetual war? 
so be it. Is this not the natural state of affairs? Is it not the only one that truly suits us? Men were all born alone, envious, cruel, and despotic, wanting to have everything and give nothing away, constantly fighting each other to pursue their ambitions or defend their rights. The lawmaker came along and told them to stop fighting like this. By conceding a little here and there, we can live peacefully together. I do not criticize the basis of this contract. I simply maintain that two different kinds of individual should never have subscribed to it. Those who, considering themselves to be the strongest, needed to give nothing away in order to be happy, and those who, being the weakest, found themselves conceding infinitely more than they were promised. However, society is made up only of the weak and the strong. And this is very much a Nietzschean sort of morality of we have the strong and the weak fighting for their self-interests. And the notion of virtue, of God, that these are illusions created in order to uplift the strong and to assail the weak. And that this is, in fact, what the social contract is. Because if you have one who is extremely strong and another who is extremely weak, when they come into a contract, the status of that strength defines where this middle line of agreement is. Of how much do I have to give up, which if I'm the strong is probably not very much, and how much do you have to give up, which if you're the weak is very much. And you might say that this is cruel, but in fact I would argue that it very much represents the state of capitalism today, for example. This war of all against all. And Marquis du Sade wants to give us something rather uplifting. A sort of solution, which is the violation of social norms. The expanding of limits and the freeing of the soul from its chains, so to speak. Ironheart writes on page 39, and this is no doubt what Sad thinks, Thus, the truly wise person is the one who, at the risk of resuming the state of war that reigned before the pact, launches himself with all his might against this pact, violating it as much as he can, in the certain knowledge that whatever profit he makes from these violations will always be greater than what he might lose if he is the weakest. For he was in no better position when he respected the pact. He may become the strongest in violating it, and if the law relegates him to the social class that he wished to leave behind, his last resource is to lose his life, which is an infinitely lesser misfortune than that of living in opprobrium and misery. These, then, are the two options facing us, crime which makes us happy or the scaffold which stops us from being unhappy. And that is the very French nature of Sad's philosophy. Give me liberty or give me death. Or in other words, give me libertinage or give me death. Give me violation, trespass, freedom, possibility, or death. That's it for this lecture. I know this is a very heavy topic, and Saad is a very not heavy-handed writer. He's actually rather, um, rather careful with his words and rather interesting in the way he develops his argument in these fictional narratives. I think it would be well worth your while to read even the first 50 pages of Justine. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, critical theory. Leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments below. 
and I'll see you in another lecture.